Welcome to a special edition of Ed's Not Dead. I'm Robbie Dodd. I am joined by my co-host, Mr. C.H. Siddons. I'm here. Good morning. <laughs> and Mr. Peter Crable. Hey, man. Bright and early. Yeah, bright and early on a Saturday. This is What's the, that murmuring in the background? <laughs> that murmuring is that we are officially on tour. First time. Yeah, first time. Ed's Not Dead this morning. We are gratified to be at James Hubert Blake High School in the Montgomery County Public Schools for the Maryland PTA Diversity Conference. We were asked to attend, and we are going to be interviewing important speakers who are all about diversifying uh, the parent membership of the PTA in Maryland and certainly working on behalf of diversity and opportunities and achievement for kids in Maryland schools. Nice to be here, right, fellas? Yeah. Excited. Yeah, yeah, they're going over the agenda for the day right now. This is kind of a, a unique experience sitting yeah. back here while there's like... <laughs> The, t- the tour bus was uh, was really hard to get out this morning. What's the exact count of how many microphones that, that we <laughs> microphone stands that we forgot to bring? Um, all of them. Yeah. All of them. Okay. Good. So, <laughs> so our guests are just going to have to hold like an old microphone as they talk. It'll around. make them leave quicker. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. We just w- really want to hear ourselves talk. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a big show today. We are going to be interviewing uh, everyone from student advocates yep. uh, for social justice in Maryland schools. We got state delegates. We got state delegates here. Who else do we have? Mr. Sids. We have uh, leaders of the Maryland PTA. And yep. we have some folks that were involved, hopefully, with um, the student protests, the, the gun control advocates, right? Absolutely. Matt Post from Sherwood High School. He's a student member of the Board of Education in Montgomery County. And also Nate Tinbite. He's Kennedy High School, John F. Kennedy High School. And he is uh, a member of the Student Government Association and the president of the MCR SGA. So we're going to get some students on the show today. That's exciting. Yep. Awesome stuff. All right. Uh, it is really cool to be in a school cafeteria <laughs> it broadcasting is. Yeah. Ed's Not Dead. Oh, we just got introduced. We did? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> They're talking about it. They're talking right about now. us right we just, now. Waved, we just waved to them. I know. Cool. It's a so little we, weird. So we just wave to the crowd, and they're all looking back at us, and it's really awkward. It's very uncomfortable. But it's, it's pretty <laughs> cool. Today, uh, just a few plugs for recent Ed's Not Dead broadcasts. If you haven't listened yet, check out our interview with Carol Ann Tomlinson, which was outstanding. That's right. Thank you, Mr. Sids, for mm-hmm. booking that. we got a lot of people that are interested in hearing it, because uh, they've heard of differentiation, and they yep. want to hear from her. Yep. And we talk, we get really into the weeds on differentiation. I'd like to also plug my, my, your, uh, your blog, my blog that's coming out. Yeah, oh yeah. Blog, blog post. post. Yeah. It's about what's well, going to be posted. It's about, it's about working out and, <laughs> and toning your flaccid body. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. That's so inappropriate. That's true. So mean. <laughs> anyway, I had to give um, a, sh- a shot at you. My you- slinking <laughs> shoulders. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Tell us, just give us a, a little, it's a little. called the orange theory classroom. And uh, I went to the gym for the first time in a long time, Mm -hmm. much to my chagrin. My wife Mm -hmm. convinced me to go, and uh, it was a really great experience for me physically and mentally, but also I was able to, I felt like connections to really good instruction. And then you wrote about it. And then I wrote about it. Yeah. How many... How many edits did Mr. Crabes have to do on the blog? I'm a narrative writer, and I tell way too much. So I always appreciate Crable's um, yeah. Spartan way of, of communicating. It was good. It was like five pages. <laughs> but I got to cut this down a yeah, little bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it wasn't bad. It was just like... It's just a lot. Yeah. It would lose people's attention. Yeah. It's yeah. down to 900 words. Yeah, I, it's no, it's really I, short and concise. I, and I had a high school journalism teacher. Her favorite word was pithy. Pithy. Crable likes pithy. Pithy. He's all about brevity, right? Is that what pithy means? Yeah, pithy is, is short and to the point. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. It's an important writing term. So like he, he like got, a pithy comeback. He got it to, yeah, he got it to the point where it's pithy. pithy. I thought pithy denoted like uh, there was like some sort smart of negative, demeaning it sounds, it sounds quality negative. to it. Could she have been tell, telling me I was pithy <laughs> and I didn't understand what she was saying? <laughs> You're like, oh, thanks for it's the been all these years. Thanks, thanks, thanks for the compliment. Oh, look it up, Mr. Sids. <laughs> what does pithy mean? <laughs> Of language or style, concise and forcefully expressive. Oh. Do you want to hear the remaining one? Boom. No. <laughs> All right. All right. So let's get ready for our first guest. All right, boys. We are excited to have Francis Frost, my old friend, and also more importantly, uh, the Diversity Inclusion Committee chairperson from the Maryland PTA. 
Uh, she is spearheading this year's Maryland PTA Diversity Conference. Hi, Francis. Hello. It's great to have you on Ed's Not Dead. I'm excited. And we all know that Francis is a loyal listener, right? That's, That's right. right. Yeah. I am. And, I am. And she probably, <laughs> of our loyal listeners, she pro- we get on her nerve probably more than <laughs> That's good. That, yeah. That's I think that's what I, we you, wanted to you do. Gotta needle a little bit. Yeah. You know what, what I mean? What did you what did Francis say in her introduction to this morning when she introduced <laughs> us to the audience? <laughs> I only overheard snippets, but it involves screaming. Yeah, she drives across the, the county and she listens to us. You all are my um, drive kids across the county uh, podcast to listen to. <laughs> that is so great. <laughs> uh, and full disclosure, uh, when I was a relatively young principal, Francis was the PTA president at the school that I, I was the principal of, and we had some great years working together, yes. right? Yes. So yeah. I've had years of practice of you have. needling you. Yeah, dealing <laughs> of dealing, right. I think, would be yeah, a Needling, that's good. <laughs> well, Francis is a champion for kids and for um, diversity, social justice in our school, so we're glad to have you. And thanks for having me. Thanks for asking thanks for us to... Here come to the conference yeah so, i thought this would be cool yeah, yeah it's exciting give, give us your vision for the conference this year well this is the um, maryland pta diversity conference it was formerly called the emerging minority leaders conference up until this year but we renamed it because we wanted it to have more of a inclusive title and for people more to understand what it was about it's not just about leaders but also about how do we address the issues of our culturally, racially, linguistically diverse children, Mm -hmm. children of color, um, families in poverty, our immigrant families, all of those issues. Um, How do we as PTAs, how do we talk about those issues? How do we make that part of what we do, as well as talking about class size and new school buildings? But how do we support all the families in our community? And at the same time, how do we raise those parents up to be leaders Mm -hmm. in the PTA so that they can speak to those issues as well? So the idea for today is to do all of that um, by talking with Maryland legislators, Mm -hmm. PTA leaders, Mm -hmm. parent leaders, and some of our community organizations that are working with our immigrant populations, LGBTQ children, um, English language learner children. So we'll be talking to all of those about the different issues that they advocate and work around. Okay, so Francis Francis said that she had never done this before. It sounds like <laughs> she's very well done. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, maybe some, one of us should be replaced on the <laughs> show, like me, the host. <laughs> okay, well that's that's awesome, boys. What uh, what what other questions do you have for Francis? What, what kind of activities do are you trying to have individual PTA organizations do at their individual schools? Um, you know, each local PTA they do their own activities, and so from the state point of view, we support them as diversity chair. I've given um, webinars so that they can take some of this information back home. And um, giving them support from emails and calls about activities they're doing. And some of those are the traditional international night, um, which is great. But we want them to push beyond that into how do you continue that relationship with families after you've had the wonderful evening of food and dance, which I love myself. Um, But how do we continue that relationship with families? Right. Um, When we have the back to school night, how are we being inclusive of all families and making sure sure that we're we're bringing them all into our PTA right. and even thinking about how PTA meetings are structured are we making it inclusive are we having translators if we need to mm-hmm. um and so how do we just make all families feel like they belong in the right. PTA and there's a place for them what what, what 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 would you say is like the biggest barrier to to connecting those families with um, the school community at large I think one of the biggest issues really is a cultural barrier, right, where sometimes families, particularly our immigrant families, um, they're, not, they're not used to the American school system and this whole idea of volunteering in school, um, the idea that parents actually have an input that school administrators will listen to, um, 
And so just getting getting them to understand that that's an acceptable way for parents to participate in school sure. is really hard. And it's not just immigrant families, but when we look um, at African American families too, the, you know, it's the whole history of our culture, our country and education and politics. That is still something that we're still working through sure. mm-hmm. as a school system, as a people, and how do we build that trust and build that relationship that everybody feels like their voice is going to be heard. Sure. So some of the different schools I've worked at have had vastly different, like, involved PTAs and sizes of PTA. So how do you go about building a bigger, more robust PTA to get those parents involved? I mean, you want to reach out, you want to invite them, but how do you actually get them in the door and to like understand that they have a voice and start using that voice as well? I think there's different um, things to think about. One um, that we'll talk about today is really being clear on what your message is. Like, do all families understand what a PTA is? Do the PTA leaders understand what a PTA is and what their purpose is supposed to be? And as a parent, I want to give my time somewhere where I feel it's valuable. Right. So I need to understand what PTA is and how that benefits my child. So that's that's the work that we have to do. So give me the elevator speech, the PTA elevator speech. What's it like? Hey, join the PTA. <laughs> For me, I always tell PTA uh, tell parents that PTA is an advocacy organization. I don't sell cupcakes. I don't <laughs> sell mulch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, for for my child's uh, PTA, we sell oranges. That is our one fundraiser, right? And then we're done. The halos? It, yes, oh, right? Man. Oranges. Um, can I do an ad? Oranges, <laughs> tangerines, grapefruit. Right. <laughs> um, but, but Everybody we, gets to plug something right, on the right, show. Right, right. We do that. So we just do that one, you know, because cause then the rest of the time we can focus on advocating for children. And that's really what PTA is supposed to be about, looking at whether it's within your school. How right. do we make this school better? Um, how do we make sure that children get the resources they need to learn? How do we make it a better environment? How do we make sure children feel safe and secure in school? Like, that is the work that we are supposed to be doing. Right. Yeah. Well, Francis, thanks for having us at the, <laughs> at the conference. Thanks for coming. Thanks yeah. for your continued advocacy for kids. Francis has clearly walk the walk she has been a local school pta president she has been the president of the montgomery county association of ptas right yes um and now she's working at the state level so she has clearly dedicated the last decade or so to working on behalf of our kids (laughs) yes i have all right so thanks a lot thanks for coming and i look forward to hearing the the whole thing yeah Yeah. and keep spreading the word about it it's not dead oh i will i will screaming it all especially when i'm driving across the county absolutely all right thanks francis (laughs) frost thank you all right our next guest on ed's not dead at the maryland pta diversity conference is delegate marisa morales delegate morales welcome to the show Thank you so much for having us, guys, for having me. It's really been a fun discussion, and I'm looking forward to jumping right into some of the questions right. that we have today. You were just you were just on a panel for an hour, so you've you've been answering a lot of questions. So <laughs> That's we've correct. been bombarded. <laughs> right. So we appreciate we're you coming. We're going to do on. them all again. Yeah. No. <laughs> we're going to have different ones, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. We have better questions, probably. We have some very active, yeah. very active parents. That's what we want. We That's want good. Active parents yeah. in our school systems. Real quick, before we hit you with the first question, sure. Uh, a little bit about your background. So, um, I am a Peruvian American. I was born and raised in, in the United States. Um, went through the public school system. Was an ESOL student during elementary school, and it's because of great teachers and and, and public education that I am who I am today. Um, And I think at very early on in my life, I uh, felt very blessed and privileged to have been born um, in in a society where education is not denied to anybody. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, the Supreme Court told us that in uh, uh, Pilar Vido. But um, I've just been very cognizant of um, just the role that education has in elevating folks, um, you know, through different economic statuses in society, and education is the is the sole equalizer, I believe. And I'm glad I love the title of of your podcast. It is it's not. Dead. It's not dead. It's not dead. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, thanks again for coming on the show. So, in your legislative leadership, um, and it seems like you probably always wanted to be a politician. 
Because you're... Guilty, <laughs> guilty. <laughs> Casey always wanted to be a teacher, and you always wanted to be a politician. That's right. Yeah. 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 I didn't know that I could be poor how, how old, and how, still be a politician. How old were you when you were elected to office? I was elected... I was 25 in the primary and then wow. 26 by the general. That wow. That is impressive. That's awesome. Yeah. We'll tell you what I was doing when I was 25. <laughs> Crable was like... Backpack several bands. I was lumberjacking. Oh, that's right. You were lumberjacking. <laughs> were you really? Yeah, in, in Colorado, right? Yeah, yeah. Is that right? All right. All right. So in your leadership in Montgomery County and in Maryland, what are the issues right now that you're working on that either directly or indirectly impact education? That's a great question. So um, because I come from a strong public education background, um, for me, it's essential that our schools have the resources and our educators have the resources that they need um, so that our students are doing their very best. Sure. Um, so supporting community-based schools, um, we've increased funding for that in this um, in this budget year, um, making sure, and then obviously hearing from our youth and looking at gun issues like gun reform, mm-hmm. um, Within the Judiciary Committee, I mean, on gun day, folks were in hearings until 2 a.m. that day. Uh Um, So we set aside $30 million for school safety Mm -hmm. in addition to, you know, us already increasing uh, the budget line for our schools. Mm -hmm. And in Montgomery County... um, you know, our needs are just, ever, I mean, just ever growing, as you know. Right. Um, Montgomery County, I'm very cognizant of the fact that we are the largest school system in, in the state mm-hmm. and 17th in the country. Um, and I think that the just embracing the beautiful diversity that our schools represent um, is very, I mean, it's very important. And the delegation also needs to reflect that. And um, wherever I go, I'm not shy about right. saying, you know, I am, I, I was an ESOL student. And right. I know that there's a stigma among students. I mean, I'm sure you've seen it among your own students. Sure. Um, that story needs to be told over and over again. And I, as much as I hate being the, the you know the token Latina in the room, right. it's almost like I can't sit on my power and not do anything right. uh, sure. to voice those those needs. And so you have to be authentic, right? And that's your story. Yeah. So you, you talked about your experience um, as an ESOL student. It sounds very near and dear to your heart. So what's being done um, on the state and local level to kind of to address some of the changing demographics? I mean, classrooms today look vastly different honestly, from even five years ago. Um, And sometimes I can definitely tell that we as an education workforce maybe are not quite prepared to deal with different students. So that's right. right. How and what are we doing to kind of get get our schools prepared to, to deal with students who are different than they were recent just recently? Unfortunately, I don't think we're doing enough. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's because I can't be the only one making that case. Sure. Um, and, uh, and when I've had to stand up to make that case, I've actually been punished for it. Wow. Um, that's why, for example, I'm not on the Apple ballot. Um, and, you know, and it's, and again, I've, I've, I speak, I'm a very authentic person. And sure. I mean, I think you can see that. And so sometimes when you have to come and, 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 and you know, be the bearer of bad news, it's not always going to be receptive. So what would you like to see? I would like for, for example, and again, the state, I mean, this, again, this is something, I'm, I, this is, I'm just like a, speaking like an average citizen because sure. the state doesn't have that role. All we do is literally cut the check. Um, but what I would like to see is for there to be an intentional effort in looking at kind of like what's going to be happening within the five and 10, 10 next years. I mean, if you look at kinder, kindergarten, first and second grade enrollment, 50% or more of our kids are of Hispanic or will yep, need exactly. ESOL needs. Exactly. Sure. And we took out, it's my understanding because I took the time out of, out of my day to meet with ESOL students. Cause I, this is, again, it's something that I'm very invested yep. in. Yep. Um, and I hear from the ESOL students time and time again, that what they need is I believe that there's, and please correct me, um, there's a title for a position, I think it's sec- second language acquisition expert, and I think mm-hmm. the county mm-hmm. only had like 10 of those positions, right. and they just eliminated those positions. Okay. So things like that, that like run counter, you know, with like to, to, to what we actually need, and the numbers are there letting us know, listen, like, you know... The, Eventually, these kids are going to be the majority yeah. Yeah. of the school system. Yeah. So whether you're, you know, you're, you're pro-immigrant or, or, or anti-immigrant, the facts are there. And we need our kids to be able to graduate and go to college so that they can become the next educators. Sure. They can become the next entrepreneurs, engineers, etc. Yeah. I feel like one of the things we've talked about on this show a lot is getting more teachers, for example. Um, we we already don't have a lot of teachers that are coming out of teacher preparation schools. Um, there's a there's a lack of candidates, first of all, and second of all, there's a lack of candidates who are 
people of color. So one of the things that I've talked about before on this show is if a, if a child is not having a positive experience in school, whether they're African American, Latino, whatever, they're probably not going to want to be a teacher right? because they've, they've experienced it in such a negative way. Right. So I, that's one issue. Do you have any thoughts on how we might get it, um, more teachers of diversity in, in schools? That's I mean, you have to, question, it, it's yeah. important to see yourself in the folks that are teaching you. I Absolutely. mean, did you have that experience yourself and, and what kind of things do you have in, in store? So one of the things that I, um, talked about with this group of these group of teachers that I met with um, I know that we have the um, what's the, the, what's the consortium where you have like law and the arts, like the academies the academies yep. Yep. that we should do something for education in that same way yeah mm-hmm. and then work with and then in, in the role of what the state can do we can connect with MC with Montgomery College and the states the state um, uh, higher ed schools mm-hmm. So that we can say, if you do two years within the academy, mm-hmm. and then you know, whatever, and then that those two years can count as credit for your your, your um, community college mm-hmm. or towards your four year uh, degree. Um, I think we should be recruiting among our own students, sure, because we have the diversity here. We're rich in diversity, so oh, you are <laughs> all the all the diverse <laughs> future teachers we need are in Montgomery. Yeah, County we have right them now. now. And, yeah. we're, and we're not directing them towards being public school teachers. Yeah. And, and we could be doing that. So anything you can do to support that, Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm really, that, yeah. that's one of my that's pet com- peeves. That's our comparative advantage, so why not exploit it? Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. So you, um, another item near and dear to your heart is criminal justice that's reform. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've talked a little bit about the school to prison pipeline. And um, if you listen to our dear Secretary of Education, it, it doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> That's right. There is no system. Right. So. There's also no education system. Yeah, there's no education system. And other tasty nuggets such as that. <laughs> anyway. Oh, my God. <laughs> so what, what are we doing on the state and local level? To, I guess, one, to recognize for those that still think that it's not a thing, um, but really to address the disparate... Um, you know, suspension rates, discipline rates, and and I guess the the sort of second or tertiary part of that question is, you know, how do you convince people that, you know, part of the disparate rates in discipline is not just oh those kids are doing stuff, is that yeah kids are actually treated differently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so no, that's a great question. So one of the things that um, I was very proud of being a part of um, during my time on the House Judiciary Committee is when we worked on. Um, Justice reinvestment, and that was it's so it, you know it was based on it's science based policies policy changes. So we worked with the Pew Foundation, and we looked at kind of the rates of incarceration and kind of the the top charges that get people um, within the system. Sure. So looking at our you know how good policy making can can result from science and from data, um, I think we, that could be modeled obviously academically as well and you can also make kind of the assumption that you know the same rates like why is it that our you know that our black and brown men are um, incarcerated at at higher rates so you could definitely you know um, just kind of mirror that into our school system Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the things that I've I've you know I've learned from taking the initiative of attending some of these conferences the NWCP has a great um, like national PowerPoint on looking at um, you know how our students are treated differently Um, you know kids that are are, you know have a track track record of being suspended earlier on in their academic lifetime um, are you know 80 percent more likely to be seen as not gifted so we're basically perpetuating that that child into you know just kind of stereotyping them Um, so what the maryland legislature has done we passed a bill this year uh, banning the use of suspension um, uh, for the grades of kindergarten first and second grades oh, wow. so i don't know if the bill passed as drafted there's always amendments sure. and yeah. there's always stakeholders and the state department of education sure. will and come let's in. Pa- let's pause for a second to <laughs> note that people are that people that kids do get suspended in elementary school oh, in yeah. first and second grades that's, yeah. that's which crazy. is astounding yeah. they do. right yeah. so yeah. i mean just to note that and to say that it is a problem Right. Starting if a kindergarten kindergartner bites somebody. What are you going to do? You got to suspend them. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 no probably, you probably have that on your record. I never that's right. Suspended a no, I mean, I'm saying you probably bit someone when you were kindergartner. <laughs> okay, that's possible. Anyway, go ahead. I had a cousin that was yeah. She was, was always bi- she was a she biter. Was, she was a biter. She was a biter. They're always biters. She was bigger than me, and she was still biting. <laughs> so her teeth were stronger than mine. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, <okay>. anyway, <laughs> uh, I digress. But um, no, there was a good point that I wanted to make, and it just escaped me. And I me. ruined it. <laughs> no, no, we okay. both ruined it. That's what yeah, we, we do, with, with, with or without amendments. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I wanted to make another <laughs> point. The 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 science, the data was was letting us know that, you know, and I think I'm sure you've heard this this analogy ad nauseum. But you know, for the same crime, you know, a um, a male versus a a white male versus a black male mm-hmm. would be you know would be thrown the book at them right by the judge. So similarly, you would have that in in the school system. Um, so that was something that you know we really took to heart. Um, and I think that the, the the that the legislature has done a good job. Sure. Um, we address this. Uh, of course, there's going to be you know we're, there's a lot more need. There are a lot sure. more needs, and I think that um, voicing that that you know a student cannot just be looked at you know their behavior. Okay, you know that's a bad kid. Obviously, the, the child has hasn't needs. I mean, sure. you know, depending on what their situation is at home, um, that's why we have in, in, in the legislature we have also addressed the need to increase funding for commu- community based schools so that kids have access to you know healthcare. Sure. Um, if there are you know mental health issues, trauma. Um, you know, violence in the home, sexual assault, et cetera. Um, and, I, and I wanted to address this earlier um, when I was asked what kinds of things I've been working on that affect um, education. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things is t- Title IX, um, kind of the Title IX progress that we, that we made under the Obama administration. Obviously, Secretary DeVos has... Um, has trying, to trying to dismantle and destroy. It's yeah. exactly Systematically right. dismantling, yeah. yeah. Well, again, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people find you? Um, Super, super accessible on social media. Um, Marice Morales, I'll spell it out for you. M-A-R-I-C-E is the first name. Morales is the last name. My mother made up my name. (laughs) It's half her name, half my dad's. I like it. Maritza and and Caesar. So Ah. Marice. Um, please don't call me Maurice. It hurts my feelings. It makes me think that I'm in elementary school all over again. And the boys are making fun of my name. Oh, We'll get right. sticks with you for a while, doesn't it? You've, Forever. So many people will yeah. answer my emails with, uh, Dear Miss Siddons. I'm like, no, no. My name's Casey, but yeah. it's a boy and a girl name, I guess. Right. There's a lot of unisex names, um, like Kelly. Mm-hmm. Apparently, the Irish um, use that for both men and, and yeah. women. So. My, my entire f- brothers, Jordan and Corey and Casey, all oh, yeah, unisex all, names. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I went to school with the Devin and um, even Sean and Shane. Oh, yeah. 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 So Shane, that's interchangeable. A, Shane is like a seventy. Well, because the Irish used to have so many children that yeah. they just uh, <laughs> they just need to name. Them. Well, just pick names. We don't even know if they're <laughs> girls or boys. Well, that's just a horrible. <laughs> is that a broad brush? Eighteen hundreds. Is it too soon about? to talk about that? Delegate Morales, thank you for joining. Ed's not dead. And on um, on behalf of the guys and citizens of Montgomery County, thank you for all that you're doing for our our kids at, in Annapolis to make sure that they've got the kind of resources and support that they need. It's the greatest honor of my life. Thank you so much. All right. And we want to see some Ed's Not Dead pictures on your awesome tw- on your awesome uh, Instagram feed. I follow you on Instagram. Great. So What's the Ed's Not Dead? Um, del- uh, what is it? Uh, At Ed's Not Dead PC on Twitter. Okay. Yep. And, We're on uh, Facebook. and Yeah. Casey's not set up an Instagram account yet. So <laughs> It's just another social media account that I wouldn't use. Like Facebook, I don't even, I can't. I can use Twitter. My, my skill set's very low. Blessed. That's it. <laughs> All right. I thought you would actually be more hip to social media since your students are so well. Wow. Pre- he is pretty good. He's the king, he's the king of Twitter. I'm the oh, king okay. of Twitter. Yeah. That's true. The yeah. self-proclaimed king. All right, Delegate king. Morales. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys. All right, good to see you. <laughs>